Well, I'm obviously an Austrian, but, you know, the Keynesians today aren't even Keynesians. I mean, Keynes wouldn't even be a Keynesian today because at least Keynes, you know, and I disagree with his theories, but at least he understood that over time, budgets have to be balanced. So Keynes's idea was that during times where the economy is weak, the governments would stimulate the economy by running deficits. And then when the economy recovered and was strong again, they would run surpluses to pay off the debts that were run up when the economy was weak. And so that over the course of a total business cycle, the government national debt would not rise. It would just go up for a while and then come back down. Uh, but today we run deficits during good times and then even bigger deficits during bad times. So there's never a surplus to pay off anything. And, you know, even Keynes knew that you can't borrow indefinitely, that you got to pay the piper. Well, we think that, you know, we're going to get a free ride. Uh, but, you know, we're in for a rude awakening. I haven't really been called Dr. Doom in a while. I mean, they started calling me Dr. Doom back on CNBC when I was coming on in 2005 and 2006, warning about the housing bubble and the coming financial crisis. And they called me Dr. Doom because of that. And I used to say, well, you know, I'm Dr. Reality. And as it turned out, I was right. I mean, the crisis that I was warning about that earned me that moniker happened. Uh, and so I was Dr. Reality. You know, they, they were the ones that were living in a fantasy world. I was just trying to, uh, you know, bring reality into the conversation. Uh, and, you know, the same thing I'm, I'm warning today about a much bigger uh, financial crisis, currency crisis that is waiting for us here. And you can call me Dr. Doom if you want, because, I mean, I am forecasting some economic doom for a lot of people. But it's not because I just want to make that forecast. It, that, that's what's there. That's what I see, because I understand uh, the errors that the central banks and governments are making. And I know uh, what, what the ramifications are, just like I knew that uh, when Greenspan was in charge inflating the housing bubble. But, you know, the powers that be did not. I mean, they thought we were enjoying genuine prosperity, and I knew they were wrong. And the same thing is happening again. This is an artificial bubble inflated by central banks, the Fed in particular. And, uh, you know, the crisis that we have, uh, you know, laid the foundation for is now much greater than the one back then. But, of course, the same people who were oblivious to the coming 2008 financial crisis are oblivious to this one, you know, even though it's even bigger. But the causes are the same. I mean, it's the same uh, bad policies uh, that have caused the problems that have sown the seeds for the next crisis. So the, the problem is, you know, we're sidelining such a large percentage of the population. Uh, they're not working, uh, but they continue to consume. And the problem there is that governments are trying to offset the damage that they're doing by shutting businesses down and forcing everybody not to go to work. Obviously, if you're not going to work, you're not earning a paycheck. And so, you know, you're going to have a recession. But what the government is doing is they're saying, well, we don't want the recession. We just don't want people to work. So let's print up a bunch of money and send it out to all these people who aren't working so they can keep on spending, even though they don't have a paycheck, we'll give them a stimulus check, and now they can keep shopping, and so the economy will keep going. But you, know, you can't consume if you don't produce. And if all you produce is paper money, then what you're gonna get is inflation, and that's what we have. And you can see prices are going up uh, rather substantially all around the world, and that is gonna continue. In fact, it's gonna accelerate as we continue uh, to move down this uh, disastrous policy path. It's certainly gonna be very problematic for average people. Um, if you're very, very wealthy, it, it won't impact you as much. I mean, if the cost of eating doubles, I mean, eating is such a small part of your overall budget that you may not even notice it. But if you spend 10% of your income on food, and the price of food doubles, and now you got to spend 20% of your income on food and you were living paycheck to paycheck, what are you going to give up in order to afford to eat? You know, and the same thing with energy, same thing with your rent. You know, if your or insurance or all these costs are going up, it's going to have a much bigger impact on 
you know, middle income, lower income, and even more so than workers, it's retirees who are living on fixed incomes. Because at least if you have a job, you could get a raise. Maybe your raise won't keep up with inflation, but maybe it'll you know, get you 80% of the way there. So you're, you're going backwards, but you're able to offset some of the increasing price with a higher wage. But if you're not working for a wage, if you've got a fixed income, you don't offset any of the inflation. Uh, so it's a huge decline in your standard of living. And it's hard to know how much a lot of the inflation will show up in the official government statistics because I think that we measure inflation inaccurately. I think prices are going up a lot faster than most government indexes would reveal. So if you just look at the numbers, you won't realize you know, how sick uh, the economy is. It's like if you got a thermometer that's broken and it always reads 98.6, no matter what your actual temperature is, if you just look at that thermometer and, and just conclude that you're okay and ignore you know, the symptoms, you know, you're sweating or, you know, whatever, you're obviously got a fever, but you're looking at some broken thermometer uh, and, and, and thinking that you're okay. You got to look at reality and not, you know, what the government is telling you. And I think more people are going to uh, experience this and they're going to realize that despite what the politicians are assuring them, uh, their situation is deteriorating. You know, on a federal level, there hasn't been a big increase in taxation, but I think on local levels, state and local governments may have been. Uh, some states have raised taxes and some probably municipalities. But I think in the U.S., most of the additional government is being paid for by printing more money. So instead of raising our taxes and taking our money, they're printing more money and taking our purchasing power. And so Americans are paying for the cost of government through a higher cost of living. So because the government is printing up so much money and spending it or giving it to other people to spend, prices go up. And so now everybody can afford to buy less because the prices of everything they're buying are so much higher. And that represents a tax because if prices are higher and you can afford less stuff, the stuff that you can no longer afford was basically taxed away from you. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, one million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow. 
in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.